Are these people who are getting a second chance who didn't receive the Lord now? It's very doubtful. 2 Thessalonians 2, 10 to 12 tells us that if people hear the gospel now and rebel, I'm not saying they, maybe they just didn't hear it or understand it. Maybe they will have another chance. But if they rebel against it and want nothing to do with it, God will send them strong delusion during the day of the Lord and they will believe the lie of the Antichrist. Are there going to be people saved in the tribulation? Yes, a multitude that no man can count. Well, where are they going to come from? Well, I remind you, they're coming right now from third world countries. The book Megatrend, which just came out, is a study, a 20-year study of the growth of religion in the world. Islam is not the religion that's growing more than anyone else. The fastest growing religion in the world is Christianity, but here's the problem. It's not in the West. It's not in the U.S. It's not in Europe. It's in third world countries. They have charted this over a 20-year period of time. Amazing. Over 175,000 Muslims every month have turned to the Lord. It's incredible. And it's still happening. There's a mufti, quite a leader in Egypt, who has a radio and a television program on El Ariba and El Jazeera. He's still on there. Nobody knows where he is. There's no address, nothing. But they've left him on there. Over 6,000 Muslims every week are coming to Christ. They can't find him, but they left his program on the TV. Why? Because so many people like it. It's unbelievable what's happening. There are 16,000 people groups that have never had a single missionary or a verse of Scripture. There are over 3,000 known dialects in our world that have never even seen the Bible in their own language. With all the work that we see our Bible translator people doing, we still have this enormous problem. Wow. Wow. Well, can 144,000 Jewish evangelists do the job? Well, that's five times the missionary force around the world out of the United States. And I'll tell you, when you get a Jew saved, I know what you're saying. We're very headstrong, stubborn. We don't like you Gentiles at all. We're very suspicious of you. And the truth is, we're hard to get along with. We know that. You come in, as I've said to you before, and I say, how are you? And you Gentiles always say, fine. You say the same thing. You ask my Jewish friends, how are you? They say, why do you ask? Why, you think I have a problem in asking? No, and I say you have a problem before you know we're arguing. We don't know how it happens. It's just a part of our personality. We argue all the time. So you may not want to talk to me afterwards. But seriously, folks, God is going to get everybody saved that he wants saved. He is a powerful God. Wow. Is there any hope at all? There sure is. Put it up there. Number six, it's a day of godly deliverance. Godly deliverance. In spite of the terrible events and tragedies described in the Bible concerning the coming day of the Lord, there's hope in the midst of it. Deliverance has been promised to some who experience this holocaust of terror that's coming to planet Earth. In Joel 2, 10 to 14, it says, The earth shall quake before them, the heavens shall tremble, the sun and the moon will be dark, the stars will withdraw their shining, and the Lord will utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great, for he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? Therefore, saith the Lord, listen to this, turn ye even to me 
with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning, and rend your heart, tear your heart, not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he's gracious. Thank you, Lord. He's merciful. He's slow to anger. He's of great kindness. Who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God? The message is clear. The deliverance is promised to those who will turn to the Lord with all your heart. In Joel 2, 28 to 32, the Lord will pour out his spirit on all flesh. Zechariah 12, 10 says the Lord will do this on the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Israel will be back in the land once again, which they are now. God will deliver all who call on the name of the Lord. Joel, Joel 3 says the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. Joel 3.20 says Judah shall dwell forever and Jerusalem from generation to generation. Peter gave the first message of the church from that passage in Joel. He quoted it and said it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's God's promise. There's deliverance even during the coming day of the Lord. God is a God of great compassion and love. Maybe you've pushed the limits of his grace and mercy towards you. I don't know what you're like. He does. But he's willing to forgive. The Bible says he's abundant in pardon and ready to forgive. Psalm 86, verse 5. I looked at this whole thing. I looked at the attitudes that are going on now among the churches regarding the coming day of the Lord. I realized that Jesus, not only in Matthew 24, but also in Luke 21, told us a parable of the fig tree and all the trees. It's pretty obvious. When it has leaves, you know the summer is near. In that illustration, the summer is the tribulation. And he said, when you see these things happening, and much of what I've just quoted, he quoted in Luke 21. Then lift up. Lift up your head. Your redemption is drawing nigh. I ask you, is it not possible that those birth pangs have already started? Do we have earthquakes in various places? The point of that passage is happening where you don't expect it. Well, we have every day so far this year. How long is this going to go on? What about famine? We got all concerned about that a few years ago in Africa. It's now worse. But we've kind of given up. Plagues? There are eight sexual diseases that are producing serious plagues with no cures. It's not just AIDS. I frequently, because of illness in my own life, both with malaria and E. coli, I've gone to the Center of Disease Control and read up on it. Do you know they don't even know why we're having all of these diseases? They say things like, well, the insects and bugs that are carrying them apparently are immune to all of our attempts to stop it. One man said, we don't have to wait for the planet to blow up. We're going to kill ourselves with the plagues. Pharmaceutical companies are producing more and more pills to help us deal with the pestilences and plagues. And some of those recommendations we now know are causing more trouble. You can't believe how many people in their 80s and 90s I have met who tell me they stopped chemotherapy, they stopped radiation, they threw out all their pills, and they've been really happy. I take so many pills, I don't even know what they are. My wife doesn't. 
but I have seriously thought about giving those babies up. Amen? You say, well, if you don't take them, you know, you could die. <laughs> Why is that a bummer? Absent from the body, present with the Lord. Amen? Oh, I forgot. We don't want to presume upon the grace of God. What kind of nonsense has happened to the Christians? What does it matter with us? Our concerns are not his. Oh, by the way, relax. Some of you are nervous right now. I can tell by your face. Just relax. Why? Because you're going to die on time. Not a day earlier. Not a day later. Hey, I'm 25. Watch out. It's not just the old dudes. That's why they don't give annuities anymore. Somebody walks up who's 70 years old, thinks he's going to die, and he lives to 95 and drives his family crazy. Do you understand? You don't know. God knows. If I were you, I'd stop taking chances and make sure of my relationship to the Lord. We're going to be with him soon. So, I went back to the Bible and I said, Lord, what should be our response to this horrible thing that's coming? You ready? Maybe you want to write them down. Number one, we should remember, should we not, that we don't know the day nor the hour when it will come. Matthew 24, 36, but of that day and hour knoweth no man, know not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. So we don't know, so stop trying to figure it out. If our suggestion tonight is right, that the birth pangs may have started any day now. See, I believe we're going to be out of here before the day of the Lord begins. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 said, God didn't appoint us as believers to that day of wrath, but to obtain salvation. I think we're going to be out of here. Some of you say, well, I'm not. I'm a post-trib. Well, you need counseling. <laughs> you must not have known what the day of the Lord is like. Oh, and by the way, maybe some of us can explain it to you on the way up. <laughs> Number two, we should realize the significance of a peace agreement between Israel and its enemies. That's what we read in 1 Thessalonians 5. And they're going crazy saying peace and safety or security. It's unbelievable. And we're not getting any better. It's getting worse and there's more violence than ever. And when they say all of this, watch out, sudden destruction is coming. Number three, we should rely upon the promises of God's deliverance for believers today. Amen? God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Revelation 3.10 says, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation. Actually, the Greek has the hour of the trial, which will come upon all the world to try them that dwell on the earth. He's talking about the day of the Lord. And according to this passage, he's going to keep us from, literally it's out of the preposition ek. It's not immunity from while you go through the tribulation. It's removal from it. You will not experience it. You will be with the Lord. You know, I just gave you a wonderful statement, and I think there was four of you who said, Amen, praise God. Isn't that wonderful? We're going to be out of here. We should be shouting it. We're going to be out of here. We're not going to go through the day of the Lord. But my friend, if you haven't settled your relationship with God, you are going to go through it. Number four, according to the Bible, we should respond by watchfulness, prayer, and readiness. 
Jesus said, watch therefore, for you know not what hour the Lord doth come. He said, be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not the Son of Man cometh. He said, watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. It's everywhere, folks. Everywhere. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Luke says, watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Which brings me to the last point. What should be our response? Number five. We should repent of our sins and turn to the Lord before it's too late. A pastor called me, he said, David, I got a lot of your tapes. You're always telling people to repent. Isn't that an Old Testament thing? I said, yes, it is, but it's also New Testament. John the Baptist told people to repent. Well, wasn't he an Old Testament prophet? Yeah. But Jesus told people to repent. Well, wasn't that before the cross? Yes. But it was also after the cross. After his resurrection, he said that repentance should be preached in all the world. But wasn't that before Pentecost? This pastor's telling me on the phone, I'm getting very weary of it. On the day of Pentecost, Peter said, repent. A few days later in chapter 3 of Acts, verse 19, he said, repent and be converted. He said, well, that's only at the beginning of the church age, isn't it? I said, listen, friend, the last words of Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation to all the churches is Repent. If my people, God said to Solomon the night they dedicated the temple, God woke him up. So there's one more thing. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and will heal their land I say to you, our land needs to be healed. America was not born in constitutional uh, principles. It wasn't born because the Constitution, they met for three weeks and never got anything done until Ben Franklin stood up as an old man and said, it seems to me we're making a mistake here. We're not understanding prayer. I move that we have no more meetings without beginning with prayer among us all. America was born in a religious revival. I was talking with some men earlier. It was a haystack prayer meeting, four guys, in a day when colonial America, drug addiction, alcoholism, white slavery, uh, they had so much problems and, and immorality and prostitution and sex and the whole place. No one really thought we could do anything with this. But God sent John Wesley and George Whitfield and Francis Asbury and Jonathan Edwards and many others like them to preach repentance is what we need. And I say to every one of you without hesitation that this government of ours needs repentance. My congressmen friends tell me it's worse today than it was 20 years ago. The immorality in Congress and the halls of Congress and our government is unbelievable. They act like there's no problem. And when they want to get rid of a guy, they can just bring up something because everybody's into it, they say. We need repentance. We need a revival among God's people. Judgment must begin at the house of God. What is the matter with us? 
one person here who decides, you know what? That's right. That's what the Bible says. And from this day forward, I'm going to live my whole life for the Lord alone. Why, God can change a community with one person. The Bible says the Lord saves with few, not many. I love Isaiah 55. I'm sure you do too if you've read it. Verse 6 and 7. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found, and call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Amen. He's a wonderful Lord. Will you join me in a closing word of prayer? Father in heaven, we are deeply concerned after studying your word. We have ignored and neglected one of the great prophecies of the Bible. An awful day is coming, and it's coming from your hand, according to the Bible. It's a destruction from the Almighty. It's a day of God's wrath and vengeance against a world that turned its back on him. It appears that the day of grace is still here one more day. I pray, Lord, for those in our audience who are not sure of their own relationship with you. Help them, Lord, not to delay any longer, but in their hearts to run to you and accept your wonderful forgiveness. I pray for your people, Lord. We've heard what your word says tonight, but many of us have not repented of our sin. Maybe things we did that we thought nobody would know. But you know, we can't fool you, Lord. And I pray, God, that you by your Holy Spirit might move in our audience right now, that we recommit ourselves to the Lord and to him alone for whatever days you have left for us. Thank you, Lord. And it's in the blessed name of our Lord Yeshua that we pray. Amen.